Hearken, heroes of the hall, and hear me, thanes and friends. Heimdall's heirs hear, and Loki's lustful leavings listen. For this is a tale of the gods. One day it came to be that Loki was upset with Heimdall, guardian of the bridge. For Heimdall it was who had discovered a party, a celebration which Loki was having the night before in Thor's hall and put an end to it. So Loki went to one of his giant kin, one of the Jotun, and said, go there and speak with Heimdall. Natter in his ear and fill it with any sound. What maundering seem pleasing to you? But distract him. And while that was happening, Loki went and decided to make some mischief. There are multiple ways, multiple roads, if you will, between our world and the world of Asgard, where the Aesir and the Vanir live. There's Yggdrasil, the world tree, whose roots rest in the lowest of worlds and rise all the way up to Asgard. And in fact, there is another tale about a man who once dared to climb the tree and brave the wrath of the gods to ask them something. There's, of course, the Sky Road, which the Valkyrie can take, which, the, uh, which some of the Venir, with their magics, can also traverse. And there's a certain stream which flows by the Smith's Hall, and which water he uses to quench his workings, but which also flows out over the edge of Asgard to fall and plummet into the waters of our own Middle Earth. This was the route that Loki took. Being a shapeshifter, he transformed himself into a formidable fish and flopped into the waters of that stream. Swam out until it went, ran over the edge of the world and thus came to where that day the foot of the rainbow bridge was set. You see, Heimdall could cause the bridge to move so that its foot rests in any of the worlds to which the gods care to go. And that day it rested here, where we mortal men and women live. As a fish, he swam until he came to the foot of the Bifrost, the Rainbow Bridge. And he swam round and round and round in three great circles until finally he caught up with his own tail and with fishy lips plucked therefrom a single shining silver scale, keen edged and sharp, and yet still the stuff of the body of a god. And clutching it in its fishy lips, he then swam to the foot of Bifrost and swam round it once, twice, thrice, and leapt into the air, drawing that keen-edged knife of a scale across the boards of Bifrost, breaching them, slicing deep. And in that moment, all the colors pent up within the bridge poured forth the pressure, pressing and bursting from those boards, the colors running out across the ocean's waves and slamming into the side of Loki, leaving him lolling, senseless in the waves for a time as the colors ran out, out through the waters, up through the land, into the roots of Yggdrasil's smaller cousins, the trees that we know, across the land. And that day, mortal whites saw colors such as they had never seen in our world. There had been color, but this purest joy was reserved to the gods and shared only in brief glimpses of the rainbows after a rain. That day, blood beat as the berserks watched. 
brilliant scarlet, the crimson. The hair of the Southern ladies, not just dark shades, but sable, chestnut. All the words we have now to describe the wondrous shades of color that came from the rainbow that day. And of course, the ladies of the North, golden, honey, like flame, their hair shone in the day. And so I could go on, as mortal men wondered at what they saw. Meanwhile, back at the bridge, Heimdall heard the noise. He is gifted with both clear sight and hearing. The noise of the colors and the bursting of the bridge, the breaching of those boards, drew his attention. He pushed away the giant who had successfully distracted him for a time. Hello. <laughs> How are you, my wife's sister? <laughs> And he looked down, and he saw there in the water the giant godfish, prodigious pike, or whatever it had been. And <laughs> with that clear sight which I mentioned, he recognized, even in fish form, that this was Loki, the trickster, the silver tail. And today, silver scale. He called to him, the Aesir and Vanir, and cried out, look, look what he has done. <coughs> and so some of them simply leapt off the edge of, uh, of Asgard down into the waters, taking the fastest way they knew. Others who could fly with their magics took the sky road and, and such. In any case, Loki was taken then with hard arms held round his head, tremendous thews grasping his tail, and he was dragged back up to the land of the gods. Others, who had not apprehended the malefactor, lifted the foot of Bifrost at that point, and in an attempt to save what they could, they turned it round foot for head and head for foot, so that what little colors remained below the breach were preserved and ran down through the rest of the bridge. But still, the color so saved was thin, was wan, uh, though the bridge without it had been clear as the ice of the Fimbral winter, which will come at the end of all times or the most delicate crystal craftings of the elves. The gods had bent Loki over the bridge, over that breach, and beat him without mercy. They used such things as they had handy. Of course, boots and fists, uh, broken furniture from the revel in Thor's hall the night before, uh, the, the haft of Gugnir taken, Odin's spear, and, and again, such things as were available to them, they forced Loki to take man's shape again. And this is how we learn that even a god can cry. And his tears were used to fill up the bridge. It was more now, but not enough. And so the gods cried out to the Allfather, Odin, Odin, please do something. Look, the rainbow, our road to all the worlds. And so the Allfather came. He looked at the bridge and he reached down and to add such oranges and reds as were found in the, in the smithies of the dwarves. From Svartheim he took these things, put them down into the bridge. He reached up to the day sky and the night sky, there pulling down all the shades of midnight and all the brightest blues and ceruleans of the noonday. And these two he added to the bridge. He called one of the youngest 
and told the spry one to climb Yggdrasil. And there from the top of the world tree, the youngest shoot or bud to be found at the end of the newest branch, the end of the newest twig just growing. Bring that green of life down. And so Verdant, he added that too to the rainbow. Before all was done, he pulled from his own hand Drotnir, the golden ring, which reproduces itself nine times every nine days. And with borrowed blade, he skirled a long and slender spiral of gold. Replacing the ring, he tossed the spiral down onto Bifrost's boards, and it pierced of its own volition, pushing down, in, back up, and out, and wrapping round the, sleep, the slit to sew it shut once more before the gold melted into the rainbow. And so, all was as it had been before. So far as the bridge was concerned, the color was restored. And for the gods, it was just another day. The trickster was taken, the prankster was punished, and they went about their business. But here, on Middle-earth, it was a day of wonder, for that was the day that Bee Frost bled, and that was the day the rainbow ran out upon this Middle-earth.